Welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, an attorney licensed in both New York and Florida, and this is the recap of Trial Day 7 in the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed case. Today, we got into the civilian witnesses to get a timeline for where the victim, John O'Keefe, the defendant, Karen Reed, and their friends were the night of January 28th before they headed to Brian Albert's house at 34 Fairview. Brian Albert's house is, of course, where John O'Keefe was found in the early morning hours of January 29th, laying unconscious in the snow in the front yard. Today, we started out finishing the testimony of Lieutenant Ray, a Canton patrol shift commander who also oversees the family services unit. Early on the morning of January 29th, he learned of the situation with John O'Keefe and that there was a possibility that John's niece and nephew, who were minors, were at home alone. If you'll recall, on the first day of trial, through the testimony of John's brother and sister-in-law, we learned that John had become the legal guardian for his niece and nephew after both their parents had died within two months of each other several years earlier. John was the one who stepped up to care for and raise the children. So we saw dash cam footage of, of uh, Lieutenant Ray pulling up to John's house where in the driveway sat Karen Reed's car and John's car. Nobody was at home. Both kids were at friends' houses. So Lieutenant Ray leaves without speaking to anyone at the house. And that was the end of his testimony. Next, the trial really shifted gears because we're introduced to John and Karen's friend community. We met two married couples, Kurt Roberts, who was married to Carrie Roberts, one of the ladies that was with Karen when they found John, and a bartender. So Michael Camerano was the first of this group, the friend group, I would say, to testify. Michael Camerano and John O'Keefe were really close friends. Like Michael had the garage code to John's house, so he was able to let himself in. He had kids the same ages as John, and they were all very close. Since Michael's wife worked weekends, overnights, the two men and their kids spent most weekends together, and the kids referred to them as our two dads. Michael and John went out Friday night, the 28th. They went to a bar called McCarthy's. Karen met up with them soon after, as did Kurt Roberts. They, the guys, they drank beers out of bottles, and Karen drank a clear garnish drink out of a short, bottom-heavy glass. We saw video footage from the inside of McCarthy showing all of this. We also saw Michael leave the group because he had gotten a call that his son got hit in the face with a hockey puck, so he had to go home. And we saw Kurt make a silent Irish exit. According to Michael, he was under the impression that John and the defendant were going to continue drinking at another bar close by called Waterfalls. So after picking up his kids, he went home and went to bed. He was woken up early the next morning by his phone ringing. It was his wife calling him to tell, calling to tell him that John hadn't gone home and Karen was frantic and she was going out to go look for him and instructing Michael to go over to John's house to pick up John's niece because she was home alone. So Michael got up and did just that. When he got to John's house, he noticed the garage door was up. And it was when he tried to use the garage door uh, automatic, um, automatic garage door to close it, he wasn't able to. So he ended up disengaging the garage door opener and using the manual pull cord to close the door before he left the house with John's niece. Next to testify was Michael's wife, Catherine Camerano. She was working an overnight shift when at approximately 4.49 a.m., the defendant called her frantically asking where Michael it was because John hadn't come home that night. And she was freaking out because she didn't know where he was. Catherine called her husband a few times, but he was sleeping at home and he missed a bunch of calls from her until he finally picked up that one call. That's when she told him about the situation and to go pick up John's niece. 
In the interim, Catherine and the defendant were communicating up until 6.34 a.m. when Karen texted Catherine, he's dead. Then in a separate text, she wrote, he was in the snow. Now, for some unexplained reason, the witness and Karen Reed never spoke again after that text message. She said she never reached out to the defendant again. I mean, Karen's phone was seized very early on, but the witness testified that she was not aware that the phone was seized. She just never reached out to her again. Very strange, right? I can't imagine a friend of mine going through something like that and not not speaking with them. So I don't know what was up with that, but neither the prosecution nor the defense got into it. The next witness was Kurt Roberts. Kurt was nice and cozy at home that Friday night when he got a text from Michael telling him to meet them out at McCarthy's bar. Kurt very reluctantly went to meet them and we saw him on the video surveillance from the bar. He had a pretty long conversation with Karen Reed, who he, like all the other friends, had met through John. He testified that there was nothing in his, in her demeanor to indicate that she was intoxicated. After his Irish exit, he went home from McCarthy's and went to bed. He was awakened around 5 a.m. by a screaming woman's voice on his wife's cell phone. It was the defendant, absolutely frantic and beside herself because John hadn't come home. So the witness's wife, Carrie, got up and went over to John's house where Karen Reed was. Sometime later, she called Kurt and told him that John had been found and the circumstances and that she was going to go drive to go pick up John's parents who lived in a different town. Next, we met a bartender named Rebecca Trayers. She worked at the Waterfalls, the restaurant bar where John and Karen went after leaving McCarthy's. There, they met up with a different group of people. Rebecca testified that she knew several people in the group through her working at the bar. She identified Brian and Nicole Albert, Caitlin Albert, Brian Higgins, and John O'Keefe, who ordered beer that night. She testified that nobody in the group appeared intoxicated. Through her testimony, video of surveillance from the waterfalls was authenticated. And we saw the group of friends at the bar, and they stayed until closing time, which was just after midnight. We saw the film showing everybody leaving the bar, either in small groups or by themselves. John O'Keefe is seen putting a bottle down on a table and picking up a short, clear glass and walking out of waterfalls with it in his hand. This is important because remember, a broken glass was found at the scene where his body was ultimately found. Next to testify was Nicholas, Nicholas Kolotithis. Nope, I got that wrong. Nicholas Kolokithis, Kolothicus. I'm going to go with Kolothicus. So Nicholas's daughter and John's niece were friends. <laughs> Earlier that evening, Nicholas had gone to his daughter's basketball game. She played on the same team as the McCabe's daughter. After the game, they decided to go to Waterfalls for dinner where they met up with the Alberts. No kids were included in this dinner. Nicole's, Nicholas's wife joined him at Waterfalls a little bit later. And he testified that John and Karen came into Waterfalls around 11 p.m. Everybody described the atmosphere as fun and a good time. There was a band performing, so people were listening to music and singing and just enjoying themselves on a Friday night. When it came about time to close the bar, there was some discussion about continuing the party at another location. Brian Albert made a sort of open invitation for the group to go back to his house, 34 Fairview. Nicholas's wife put the kibosh on that, letting him know in definite terms that they were not going anywhere else that night. So Nicholas didn't get to go. He left Waterfalls just after midnight. It started lightly snowing. Our final witness was Karina 
Colothicus. Colothicus. Oh, sorry. Nicholas's wife. She testified that once she got to Waterfalls that night, the vibe was good. Everybody was having a nice time. She kind of gravitated over to where the other women in the group were, and she got to have a conversation with the defendant. She said that Karen was almost gushing about how awesome John was and how much she admired him, how he'd taken such a big burden upon himself, and that she sometimes wished the rest of the family would help out more with the kids. And she also let them know that they had a vacation that was planned. When it came about time to close the bar, there was some discussion about continuing the party at another location. And Jen McCabe threw out an invitation to go to her sister's house at 34 Fairview. Like I mentioned already, Karina told her husband that they were going home. No after party for them. On the way out of the establishment, this witness heard Jen McCabe saying playfully to Karen, you're coming with me. But a moment later, she saw Karen with John. She only noticed it because she thought Karen was going with Jen. The last time Karen, the last time Karina saw the couple, they were walking toward the black SUV. And thanks to this witness, we also know that 34 Fairview is about five to seven minutes away from the waterfall bar. And everybody was leaving just around about 1210, 1215-ish that night. Karen and John were last seen walking towards her vehicle, but we don't have testimony yet establishing who got into the driver's seat, if that was seen by anybody. So this evidence, assuming it is presented, will go towards the Commonwealth's charge against Karen for driving under the influence causing a death. But there was no testimony today from the people that were with her and the bartender who, ser who served her, none of those people said that she appeared to be inebriated at all. So we'll have to see how the prosecution deals with that charge moving forward. So we got into the friends and community surrounding John O'Keefe, mostly the niece and her friends and their families that ended up being support systems for John. These people hung out together because their girls played team sports together. So a common theme throughout today's testimony was that everyone who talked about Karen Reed talked about how great she was and how much Karen admired John for everything he took upon himself to do. Nothing seemed suspicious about the relationship. There was nothing toxic or abusive in their demeanor. In fact, there was testimony that they were very affectionate and lovey-dovey, and we saw that on the, the video surveillance. One of the witnesses even joked that his wife, who was also a witness, pointed out to him that he was not as affectionate with her as John was with Karen. So to sum up from today's testimony, we now know that Karen and John were out together having a nice night out on the town. These were people, some of whom knew each other for years and years, and others bonded because of their shared interests with their kids. But we know that these were all friends, enjoying life, enjoying live music at the bar, all leaving together. And then something terrible happened. So thanks for joining me for this recap. Until the next drop, peace.